The story so far, I am attempting to port Fuzix to the ESP8266. I have the kernel running, I've got a file system working using the Dara FTL library. This is on the internal flash. I have binaries loading, in it is running to a certain extent. It's crashing partway through startup and I'm trying to investigate what's going on. So last time I spent some time debugging the startup sequence as it crashes part way through the boot process. This is it dead. So if I press the reset button, it reboots. It does some stuff and then it falls over. Now I said that I was going to do some work trying to figure out what was wrong with the file system which I've done and it turns out to be pretty simple. I have I was putting a logical file system that was a, I think it was about 1400 bytes of 1400k what was it here we go 1450k onto the NAND flash and after Dara's overhead for doing the FDL translation the available space was uh, 1465k now this turned out to be a very bad idea the FDL system needs a certain number of free pages in order to operate and there weren't enough so it was spending all of its time garbage collecting trying to free up space in order to copy pages so what I did was I did a very nasty bodge where after filling the file system we copy this file padding onto it which is full of queues it's 10 megabytes of course this won't fit so what will happen is it will write as much as will fit onto the file system filling all available free space with queues and then we delete the file this removes the directory entry but of course it leaves all the queues on the file system uh, any, any additional files will overwrite them then my MOOC FTL program detects whether it's copying an entire 512 byte sector full of queues if it is then it knows that this sector is unused therefore it tells Dara that it is unused and the end result is uh, we have used 850k of the 1465k on the Dara logical device so all the remaining sectors are empty this gives Dara loads of space with which to work and as a result everything runs more quickly so on boot what is happening is I added a bit of more, bit more tracing in various places it starts the init program here you can see it loading in it init is now running it's doing various file operations here it is opening a file which is of course the init tab uh, we get the banner as init starts up it does stuff and then it forks now what's actually happening is if I load it up uh, where's the fork line this is all user code we are here so it does the fork the parent process gets swapped out which is what these writes are doing uh, the current process becomes the child so that becomes this stuff here it does some stuff and then it tries to execute this program called etcrc that fails etcrc is a shell script therefore execv will not touch it because it's not an executable binary and then it tries to run the shell in order to run the script this also fails because there is no bin sh on the file system we haven't built that yet 
which means that uh, in it, uh, the child process will print an error, which is happening here. It prints args2 here is rc, then there's a colon, and then it says unknown error2. Two is uh, e no end because there is no bin sh. It says unknown error because p error actually gets its errors in a file on disk, um, which you can see it try to open here, which obviously doesn't exist. We just haven't copied that onto the file system yet. After printing the message, it exits which you can see here. After which, we swap in the old process, which is in its parent, and fall over. And then we spew errors here. So what we need to do is, firstly, we need to get binsh running. Well, we need to get binsh building and put it on the file system. We need to find out where this error, this file containing all the errors is and put that on the file system because that will make future debugging easier and we need to find out why the kernel crashes when exit is called. So the easiest bit is to find that file. The so I've been getting all my files from here I put them here as part of the MSP430 work, but it's all very bit rotted. Like, you know, I think the last time I touched anything was October 19. I don't know why these are updated. January the 21st. Interesting. That's only a few, a few weeks ago. So, let's take a look at the library. So, the library libs p error stir error is going to do the work error dot c stir error so it's trying to open path lib error user lib lib error dot text uh, have we created user we've created user but we haven't created lib so user mcdir lib chmod 755 lib the user lib right now where is our lib error dot text library libs so b get library libs lib error dot text okay so let's try All right, that seemed to work. Uh, I'm not going to write the flash yet because we've got some other stuff to do, such as building sh. Now that's in applications. There's quite a lot of stuff in here now. There's, uh, there's a lot more than there was when I did the MSP430 stuff. So where is sh? v7 command sh yeah and here are all the other uh, commands so we need to build them too so I have seen sorry pouring, pouring myself more drink I have seen these shs before this is, if I remember correctly, this is the original born shell. 
and it is notoriously difficult to understand. Uh, this might be a different shell, but I really don't like the look of some of this code. I know it works. Anyway, we need to build it. So let's copy the uh, util make file. Uh, application e7 v7 um, and this is going to need a fair bit of fiddling So all the stuff in utils were each each source file turned into one binary. Uh, with this, this is all built as a single application. So this actually needs a lot of simplification. What happens if you build this? Interesting. So the that should be defined in library include sys. No U temp. Interesting. Wait a minute, this is this isn't the Fusix U temp, this is a different one. Okay. Right, what's happening here is that uh, this is supposed to be configuring the compiler and where all the include paths are and uh, the built-in the Pico libc, which I installed way back when, has installed its own headers, which we do not want to use, because they're being found uh, in preference to the Fusix ones. So we want to add our headers first. Um, 
that work? No. looking for a way to change, change the order. So C has two include file lists. There's system ones and uh, user ones. And minus I by default adds user ones. However, system ones are looked for first under some circumstances. It's all annoyingly complicated. There is a section on preprocessor options. Okay. Really? Should, minus I should be in here somewhere. So it's not the same as minus include. Minus include adds a file of directory options. which does not seem to be documented. Fantastic. Now, one thing I could do is just do uh, node stood ink, uh, which will turn off all the system. Uh, it'll remove all paths from the, uh, the include directories. However, I don't actually want to do that because we do need the stuff supplied by the compiler. I think it's i system. So let's just try this. Yeah, I put that make file in the wrong place, which wasn't helping anybody. Right. Uh, this needs to have another one of those. Okay. No ac.c or cold.c. Wait a minute. 
Yeah, I got all this hopelessly wrong. Right. Yes, and this also explains the oddities I saw in the... Uh, the make file I was copying. In fact, let's just... Copy one of the original make files, replace our rules, and let's leave it like that and see what it does. Right, that is these relative paths. Uh, because I'm invoking this from a different directory, these relative paths are now wrong. Other bits of the build system... Um, they refer to a physics root variable. But this does not. So... I'm going to have to do this. And then in the make file, which is this one, we're going to have to do root equals uh, that, I believe. And then this can become that. Do not like make based build systems. Okay, that did build most of the way. What doesn't it like? Lots of warnings due to this being very elderly code. And at the bottom, it's trying to link against read line. Um, Has that worked? Well, it worked. Okay. And we've got our binary, which is 16K. SH is quite big as binaries go, and this is occupying half our code space. However, I will also build the rest of these binaries which is this one and applications rules dot ESP8266 we can lose all this and I've link we can keep everything else Alright, and that has built all of our user land. Well, some of our user land. Oh, and I need to 
edit this as well. Util make file. So let's commit that. And then we start doing stuff with this. We want to we want RSH. So that's three seven Command SH So what else is there? All of these uh, applications V that should be that. So it's AC act on at. Hang on, I've got a list. It's in the make file. That did what I thought it did. No, it didn't. Let's backslash that. That is better. So we these applications e seven command okay, that one's a duplicate, and we also want to change the uh, permissions to make them executables ghmod0755 alright so we go into the kernel, we update the flash is it going to fit? yes We've used maybe another 200k, but there's still a decent amount of space left. All right, so while that is writing, which will take a while, let's go and have a look at exit and see what is special about it. This, not a lot. So what does do exit do? Not much. Uh, what? An That's not doing what I thought it did. I want to search for do exit. Why is that so slow? Right, process.c. All do exit should do is terminate the current process and uh, schedule 
the next runnable process. The next runnable process will be, in our case, init. So I do not recall if we saw these messages, but we can certainly turn them on. Like so. What does it actually do? It says it's exiting. If init gets killed, panic, because init can never kill. Sync the file system. Uh, discard the slot in the page map. Close all open files. Current working directory and the root of the file system are no longer in use. Something to do with clocks. Something to do with signals. Free the TTY. Mark, it, uh, mark ourselves as exited in the accounting. Tell the parent it's ready. Switch to the parent process. I don't see anything there that's particularly untoward. My best hypothesis is that it's something wrong with my code here and that do fork here is saving stuff in a way that when the parent is switched back in it's corrupting things. So how is this being done? We just create a uh, an eight slot stack frame. Okay, that's finished. Uh, let's just. Oops, why isn't that working? This call. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so the syscall name here is an array, and apparently it is not stored in the kernel anywhere, so it gets used. It gets inlined into the object file that uses the uh, uses the array and we're now using it in two places mm, no no I think that's actually rubbish this is cool args Interesting. Well, the the default kernel deep tracing is better than ours, so let's turn ours off. I th think I need a clean. Didn't help though. Process dot O. Right. 
Right, okay. Yeah, um, I was including this file which has got all the definitions in it, therefore it was appearing in two different object files which will never work. Right, let's run that. Okay, run in it. Swap out. Run, loading sh. Ooh. Um. I don't know what that means. Well, I believe that the uh, that we now have the file system working. So let's just take out some of the tracing. just to make things a bit less spammy. I know freed. Panic I know freed, which is happening in file sister C which happens it happens when we dereference an inode that has already been free which is already has a reference count of zero um, what this will mean is that we failed to reference a inode somewhere This is all happening inside exec, so So it could be this. Let's just spread some tracing through here. So the thing I'm wondering is, is this happening from user code? Probably not, as we would have received a syscall trace message. It could be happening here. Um, it, the inode is opened here. It's the actual file. You can see it's, see exec bin sh is happening there. We know it's reading the binary, so it's getting to here. So it's either in user code or it's in uh, something in the signal handling stuff. I did see a signal handling trace message. Let's see what this does. You got 186. Right. So it's not entering. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on, there's a call to do exec. Right, this is bouncing through user code. All right, so it must be something to do with the signal handling. I haven't even thought about signal handling. So, where is this sig2 message coming from? 
process.c again. S sig. Could it be this? Is platform do exec returning? That should never happen. In fact, it makes sense to have a panic here. Right, it's running sh. Okay. Do exec returned. Well, do exec is in here, and it's the simplest thing ever. The only way this could return is if the entry point function of the binary, which is sh, were to return. Uh, on entry to this, a0 is the return, is the, uh, the link register. And it's not modified when we call into user code. So if sh's entry point was wrong somehow, and it was to return, it would end up returning from do exec, that would be bad. So, this suggests that our sh make file is wrong. Now, it's v7 command sh ok extensor option yes sh bin so we start at oh dear that's not right and I know what this is going to be. This will be that I put some debug code into one of the two CRTs and then either failed to rebuild after taking it out or left it in. I left it in. Okay. So this is a long and annoying rebuild process. Right, that's the libraries. So we need to build the utils. Okay, v7 command, we need to build these. Thank goodness we don't have to do clean, we need to do these. Okay. And we need to update the flash and write it, which will take forever. This doesn't explain why we get the crash on exit, however. Yeah, and I would also do not like that the only difference between these two files is this single call. 
we could common out the code and use the preprocessor to decide whether to call this or not. That would probably be better. And while that's building, let's do that. So. So we're going to copy this to here. unhappy about this being the comment character but I think it's the capital S so it's been run through the preprocessor and I think the preprocessor is smart enough to know the difference so this then becomes CRT naught template ESP8266 uh, let's make that a def, actually. So what's it actually done? There does appear to be nothing there. Pull that. All right, so even though it's a capital S, it hasn't run it through the preprocessor. Yes, that's because it's actually invoking the assembler directly, where what we actually want to do is um, we want to build these with the here we go with the C compiler And that should do the right thing. So let's try that. It's trying to link it into an actual Okay, here we go. I'm a little surprised as to why that Oh. Huh. Well, I'm going to have to reflash again. is annoying. Yeah, and again, the build system's not smart enough to know that they are to know about the dependency, so I'm going to have to put that in myself. is 
equals CRT0 depends on template platform dot def. That file is wrong. Library libs. CRT not template Interesting, it's not honoring the mode line. It possibly it doesn't understand that comment character, but it's Oh, come on, why isn't this building? I did tell it about the dependency. this need to be the Omsh? I didn't think it did. Apparently it does. Oh well. But it's still only building one of them. Uh, I also know that putting multiple files on the left hand side of a pattern in make doesn't do what you think it does so let's just do that dot o Only built one of them. It is continuing to only build one of them. Okay, so it does know about both files. Which both exist. So this is the version for Nostad.io, so we just want to include the template with nothing in there. Ah, ah. Uh, I put these dependency rules here, which meant that without a... Uh, that turned out to be the first rule in the file, which meant that when you invoke the make file without any arguments, it finds the first one, 
which is not the one you want, so yeah. Do not like make. Do not like make at all. Right, and that's built both. Okay. And once more. Uh, applications util maker ESP 8266. Applications v7 command capital V v7 command sh say flash and write. And while that's going, I'll take the opportunity to go and make some tea. Okay, T has been acquired, so let's burn this again and see what happens. See whether it actually starts up SH. Well, this won't actually give us an interactive shell. This is going to run the startup script, if it works. Okay, running SH. Ooh, it's doing stuff. It's doing lots of stuff. It's it stopped doing stuff. Okay, let's have a look and see what happened. So exec init, exec. I'm trying to run RC. Here it's running sh. Sh is now running. It's doing the things. Right. SH is being swapped out in favor of another process. I. So here it's forking. Here it's doing the low level. Fork. Uh, shouldn't we be seeing an exec somewhere? No, we won't be seeing an exec until it actually, until the child process actually tries to call exec, which is happening here. So here it's trying to run RC. That should fail. Yeah, you see it returns minus one with this error code. It's yeah, this is the file name, so now it's opening the file name, now it's running the script. So we fork, we run fusuk, which in turn runs fusuk fusix, which I believe does not exist. Yeah, exec here returned error code 2, so that's actually going to print a message, except it doesn't actually appear to have. Um, so Fusuk should be returning, it's swapping in process 2, which is sh. It's then forking again, presumably for the next command, and then it stalls. So, this could be the same bug, the exit one. Um, I'm just trying to th think. This is actually not the most convenient for testing with, as it ends up running lots of complicated stuff. Is there something I can run instead of init that will start up a shell? 
will the startup process and immediately terminate? I can run Fusuk. Because Fusuk will immediately try, it will fork and immediately try to run a uh, Fusuk Fusix, which doesn't exist. So let's take a look at kernel start.c. Where would I be if I were an init string? I would be here. So let's change this to bin for suck. And build that and see what happens. Right, running for suck. That did everything right. So it try it executed Fusuk. Fusuk then printed an empty message and exited. Excuse me. Uh, which is not really what I was expecting. Do I need arguments? Let's just do what this what the RC script was doing. Which is for suck minus a slash. Okay. Yeah, again, that did everything right. It exited, the parent exited. Oh, wait a minute, this isn't forking. It's not starting Fusuk Fusix as a child process, it's just calling exec to replace itself with it, otherwise, it would be swapping itself out. Blast. Um. How about sh? We can do that. That will start a subshell. And while sh is quite big, true is quite small. So sh is loading. Swap out. Swap in, and it stalls. Well, it hasn't crashed, which is a bit of a shame. What it's doing here is it's dumped the process table. So each of these represents one runnable process. And we have two. We've got this one, PID1, and we've got this one, PID2. PID1 is in it. PID2 is status 7, which is uh, zombie. Uh, that process has exited and is waiting for init to reap it. That is, to read the return status and free up the process slot. So here, I can see that it's swapping in SH. You can see there's quite a lot of it. 16K of code. It's a very exact 16K of code. Uh, 
And then we immediately go to do fork. No, no, we don't. That is not where we should be going. Ah, no, no, that is right. Uh, it's swapped in the process, resumed it, but of course the last thing that the parent did was call fork. So this is the tracing we get out immediately after Uh, kernel syscall proc. So this is the tracing we get here after do fork returns. So that we can see that uh, do fork, this is this process uh, also known as now, this is the new process it created, which is, of course, PID2. Returns. This is the return code. That's not right. Okay, this gives me a suggestion as to what's wrong. Now, remember that the parent returns the PID of the child. So our our do fork which lives in here we should have saved the the PID into slot 5 of the stack frame which will then cause uh -huh, it will then cause a switch in to read that value out of the stack frame to return us the status code and if I do uh, 76290, that's this value here, the garbage that's been returned, and I, that's not right either. Okay, I thought that was going to be a 2, but it's not. A2 is the ptab, yeah, ptab pointer. So we save onto slot 5. Slot 5 is not being touched anywhere else. So we read slot 5. Uh, IU, because you want to zero, ex uh, extend it. Really? UI? UI. Okay, what's this doing? Here we go, do fork returns 2, which is the correct PID. And then it returns to init. But we still get no more tracing. What should be happening here is that SH is continuing to run and then will terminate. So we should see some more system calls and then a panic. So the fact that that is still crashing is annoying. This is where a debugger would be really useful and in fact I do have a shiny new JTAG debugger, a clone of an Altera USB blaster, but I tried to build OpenOCD with the 
ESP8266 stuff in it and it doesn't work, so uh, that will need a bit more research. I am still guessing that what has gone wrong is something to do with this code. Because the only thing that's different here than elsewhere when all this stuff worked is that we are returning to the parent process. Of course, we did see previously that the parent process was working, the returning to the parent was working just fine. Um, Let's stick this tracing back in. Of course, we can't use the system call names, so... And we also don't want to dereference EF, because EF, we were seeing last time, was mangled. Uh -huh. Right, that is more what I was expecting. We see here... Oh, interesting. Disassemble that and image this four oh two one two seven OC. So this is the entire call to printf. It has A12 is uh, it's got to be wait so this has got to do with the extensors kind of odd shifting mechanism, which I haven't looked into yet, so let's go and have a look. Set shift amount for little Indian byte shift. This writes a value into SAR for a write shift by multiples of 8. The write shift amount is the two least significant bits of the address register multiplied by 8. SSA 8L is the same but for left. So it wants to do a shift of whatever the contents of A14 are multiplied by 8. Now A14 was set Uh, up 
here. Um, ah, right. The reason why this code looks weird is because this has been compiled with the 32-bit access parameter. So that anything that, uh, any code generated by the C compiler that's not a that's an 8 or 16-bit value is actually going to be accessed as a 32-bit load or save plus bit shifts. So what this is doing, all this stuff, and the reason why it's so complicated is fetching values and Uh, extracting fields like this this instruction XUI uh, extracts bits 0 to 8 from A3 into A3 so we shift shift right by Two. Sorry. Okay. Shift the contents of the register right, inserting zeros at the left by a constant amount. There is no surly for shifts greater than or equal to 16. So that's a simple shift. So what on earth is this doing? Ah, it's setting up a value for this. And surl, shift right logical, Shifts by the number of bits in SAR. Okay, 270C, which is here. Uh, this is... This is rounding A14 right. I know what this is doing. A14 is an address. This is pulling out the bottom two bits of the address and putting it into SAR. That will indicate whether it's a 0, 1, 2, or 3 offset within the word. These two instructions are then truncating the bottom two bits by shifting right by 2, then shifting left by 2. The end result is that the bottom two bits become 0. Then we dereference the pointer to read the 32-bit value. Then we shift it right by the number of bits we pulled off the bottom of A14. And then we extract the bottom eight bits of it. So this is doing an eight bit access of whatever is in R14, which in this case is going to be UData. So UData should be an L32R somewhere which will load the value of UData because UData is a constant. I don't see one. This is the only reference I can see to A14. Oh, here's one. So here is another reference to a view data, which is in A13. Which is A12 plus 8. This is doing lots of references to... Okay, here is, 
Here it's loading new data into A12. Right. It's computed new data plus nine here and put it into A14. So uh, what's happening is that GCC is being clever about its various offsets. This is very, very much sounding like uh, that, like A14 has been corrupted. So let's do a bit more verification. I don't know whether this will work. It may just disturb the code enough. Of course, UData is on the user stack. data is zero. No, sorry, the data is not. Of course, it's not on the user stack. Uh, at this point, we're all we're on the kernel stack. Uh, data is a constant address anyway. It's in memory. So yeah, I think that uh, we are corrupting registers. So. Here is our, here's where we're saving the registers onto the stack frame. And here's where we're loading them. The old stack pointer is stored at this address on the UData. We load it here. We then load A12 from slot zero a13 from slot 1, A14 from slot 3, A15 uh, A14 from slot 2, A15 from slot 3, A3 which becomes SAR is from slot 4, A2 is from slot 5, A0 came from slot 7, and then we retract over the old stack frame and exit. Now, this will exit into the do fork routine which is here. So it will then go and call lots of stuff and do lots of stuff as it exits from the routine. Well, actually, this code won't be executed, but it is going to be doing this bit. Fork then will return to Unix syscall. which is in process.c. It's in kernel process.c.
we then print our return value and then we do lots more stuff such as checking for signal dispatch then we return to here at which point we discover that the contents of our registers have been corrupted Yeah, uh, our old U data was in A14. So if our registers were being corrupted by the switch in, switch out process, I would not expect any of the Uh, the rest of the syscall code to work so why is it suddenly failing here Unix it sounds like Unix syscall is not saving A14 Here is Unix syscall. It's saving A14. It's using A14. Okay, things I may have forgotten. So do exec is calling isync before returning because uh, we've just written to the instruction memory. Now on swap in that also happens and possibly I have forgotten to do that. So let's just make sure that we do do an isync. But I don't think that's it, because this looks like a data error rather than the code error. We should also actually... Is there a rsync? There is an rsync. Uh, no, that does these. I think. So we don't have to worry about we don't have to worry about synchronizing the data cache when we are reading back values from data. I mean if that doesn't work, then the cache doesn't work. Right, memory weight. Make sure that all previous memory operations complete. Oh, that's cool. There's a min instruction. I actually rather like this instruction set. It's nice and dense and uh, looks like it's got lots of features.
it's possible that uh, no, I was, I was thinking that maybe there was a caching issue that meant that after we loaded the new process, when we were loading back the, uh, the the registers, we would get stale values. But again, this is all going through the data cache, therefore it must be correct. The only times this could not be correct is when we actually return to the process and we start executing code from the previous process that hadn't been flushed from the cache. And I don't think we're getting that far, but let's just try that anyway with that iSync in place and see what happens. Okay, SH, swap out, swap in, and it fails, it falls over. We needed this anyway. So at this point, we are on the right stack. Okay, uh, so maybe the stack's corrupted. Let's actually, we should have some tracing here that tells us, ah, uh, no, I got rid of it. Um, let's just find out where the stack pointer is approximately. It's, uh, actually, let's do this. So this will calculate how close the stack pointer is to the UData block. Uh, it causes above UData. It's, I don't think we've run out of stack again. Again, if the stack had been corrupted, how are we even getting this far? Interesting. U data should be below the stack pointer. but we would only be getting that if it was above it. Are we on the wrong stack? Oh, and I also want to find the previous syscall. Here we go, 1472. That's the number I was expecting. That's not the number I was expecting. Okay, swap out, swap in, swap out. C 
So, 3F FF B4D0 is it is the user stack. Let's look a look at previous system call. Oh, it's always that. But, but, but we put in code to switch stacks. We're crashing here now. Okay, uh, we're looking for syscall handler. Let's see if this is doing what I think it is. Okay, so. Here's where we do the, the printf. Um, A3 becomes e, A1. That should be cause. Wait, that's the stack. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, cause is apparently the first value. No, wait, this is saving A3 on the stack. So A3 is. Uh, A3 is the value of cause. We've saved A3 on the stack, right. And now the stack pointer is being set to A3 before the call to kprintf which means that the first parameter, this one, is the actual stack pointer. So let's take a look at our syscall stub. We save the user stack. We switch to the kernel stack. Let me take a look at those addresses again. Um, I do keep re misreading. Three F F F B. It is right. That is the kernel stack. I'm an idiot. Uh, I was getting this block mixed up with this block. Yeah. Okay. That is therefore the right value. I notice this is always the same stack pointer for every system call, which is exactly what I would expect because it's doing the same piece of code. So it's actually going to be the values on the stack which are important. Data here is AF19, it's always AF19. It looks like this has died on exit.
So let's dump the stack and see what there is to see. This is coming perilously close to changing the code enough that whatever's going on might not manifest. So that's it doing all the system calls. So we see our own local stack frame, which is probably the zeros, because everything happens in 16s in this architecture. And then Oh, 48 bytes. So that's 16, that's only, yeah, that's only 32 bytes, but let's take a record of this and then scroll up. So this is the shell calling init. Uh, the shell trying to execute true. Somewhere in here should be our fork. Our fork should be syscall32. So 35, signal, signal, 18, 32. Here is the fork returning in the child and we see garbage here is fork being entered so that this is the stack that we should be seeing here um, I think that's just all wrong actually so here it's writing a3 onto the stack Um, here it's calling printf, that is a2, a3, a4, we're interested in the computation of a4, so uh, loading via a2, a2 is the sum of the stack pointer, that's ampersand cores, and a2, and a2 is a5 shifted lefted by 2, a5 is our loop counter, this is multiplying it by 4. This is looking dead suspicious, actually. So, what are we actually storing? Um, the address of, well, A3, which is the cause, is being written to stack pointer plus zero. That should be showing up there. That's that one we're seeing here. But when this returns, there's nothing of the kind. This is what we like to call in the trade completely buggered so why is that wrong signs do point to something around our fork and return routines Uh, 
I am going to change this to 16. That will just dump 64 bytes. So that will show us the 48 bytes of the our mains of syscall handler stack frame plus 16 bytes of unix syscall stack frame no sorry it doesn't work that way around 16 bytes of the parent callers stack frame and it dies so what we see is this On entry, where's that fork? 35, 35, 18, 32. This is fork returning in the child. This is fork being entered. Um, no. No, 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 all no. Sixty four K of code plus thirty one and a half K of Uh, sorry, 64k of data plus 31.5k of code plus 1.5k of U data is 97. 1.5 plus 1.5 is 33. Swap size looks like the right number. Things that we could be overwriting, but the UData block shows up first in the swap. We could be overwriting the UData of one process by another. That means the order in which we write them will very much affect the uh, the behavior of whether it breaks or not. that we can see all these numbers here so this is udata writing 1536 bytes at block 291 which is three blocks long and in fact as each swap each swap slot is 97k which is 194 blocks that seems like a wrong number um map time swap size that looks right how can we get to 291 from a integer So, where's our fork? Right, we are writing to... Map 
by swap size. I've got my parentheses around swap size. This isn't kilobytes, it's blocks. Oh. So all my swap slots overlap each other. Okay, let's try this. Okay, running SH. Swapping out, running true, swapping in. And it falls over again. In exactly the same behavior. Uh, it's now writing at 582, which is slot 3 Interesting. Why is it swapping to slot three? So, what is wrong now? Uh, well, let's take a look at the file system image. File system image is 777 sectors, which is seven, well, it starts at one and ends at seven. which is slightly more than four stack slots, uh, swap slots. So I believe we do have enough space in the swap partition for all of our swap slots. Therefore, we can't be overwriting the end of the swap partition. Now, let's just take a look at the swap tracing. So we start at 582, which is slot 3. 585 is where the code starts. So we should be writing three blocks. Well, we can tell how many it is which is uh, three blocks at this address. And we are writing from UData, that's, that's correct. When we swap in, we're writing to UData.
So I'm writing 16k from 713 onwards, which is 32 pages. So that's 745, which is. 'm using up all of our stack slot but this is still garbage see this looks right So this is a valid stack frame, which we can tell because it's got one as the cause. This is not a valid stack frame because we can tell because it's completely different. But how does it get here? it shouldn't be able to return as far as main.c with the stack frame garbled like that. Unix syscall will actually appear uh, above the stack frame we're seeing and Unix syscall will do stuff like save a zero onto the stack. If the stack's been corrupted, then it'll load back the wrong a zero and fail to return properly. The only possible explanation is that it's only this bit of the stack that's being corrupted. Is USP being touched anywhere? Only in our code. What's this doing? C U C W D. That's debug code. We are storing the stack pointer in the right place, which is A3 is UData, yeah, yeah. So this is us storing it, this is us loading it. Swapper should have done the work of copying the new stack frame. I mean here we're loading we're loading a zero, the link pointer, out of the stack frame that we've just restored. It must be at least slightly correct. Oh well, let's try this. Comment these out. And on entry to Unix syscall, let's dump the stack frame. And on exit, 
let's dump the stack frame. And let's also put that in. So what's this going to do, apart from reduce lots of tracing? This looks like it's finally doing a garbage collection. Uh, it hasn't crashed, but it's hung. Okay, so this is what we got. This is a normal looking stack frame, and yes, it looks like a perfectly normal looking stack frame. Uh, that's different. Let's, let's go find the other side of that fork. Alright, this is the child returning. This is the parent. So this is the parent's entry, and this is the parent's exit. Uh, this this code, this disassembly is stale, but it looks like. Assuming that it uh, hasn't moved, uh, the link pointer is at 2.8, which is uh, 7. I'm trying to remember my 4 times table. 7. Um, no, that's not right. So where does it put it in the new code? 76, really? Yeah, and that's not appearing on this. Yeah, this hasn't actually told us much because the stack frames on entry and exit are actually different. Uh, we could move this code to either side of the dispatch. Would that tell us anything? We would expect the stack frames to be the same. So let's see if they are. We can get rid of this. I am wondering if there is actually corruption happening at a fixed location in the UData block. And as I'm changing the code, because the stack usage is changing, it's, uh, the behavior is slightly changing. Okay. So that's exit. 535, 18, swap, swap, entry. These values are different. See, that's a ROM address. This is a data address that's actually 
Yeah, this is ROM code. This is ROM data. This is quite different. That's an integer and this is a address. Yes. And if I look at the other routines, so here's syscall 31 sbrook. This is entry, this is exit, and they are the same exactly. this tracing out and we know that this has called this piece of code and do fork here is doing most the bulk of the work so let's put this in add the variable we also need to change sys.c and get rid of that okay what's this doing And we die. So, on exit, it's now they're easy to find. Uh, this is the child returning. This is the parent entering. This is a different value. Intriguing, because I... That 5 being different is actually rather reminiscent of this, because... We're actually using slot 5 for the, the PID. And that's a perfectly normal looking PID. Uh, I would actually expecting 2 in this case. But this is entry and this is exit. So it dumps the stack and then it calls do fork. And it allocates an 8 byte stack frame and it sticks stuff on the stack frame and it saves the stack pointer here. And here it loads it back again. And then here it loads stuff off the stack frame, and here it restores the stack frame. So, this stack frame actually appears above this one in memory. So, as far as this code is concerned, its stack pointer is about here. And this is SP plus 8 slots.
Now we're calling swap out while running off the current kernel stack. We're writing the whole UData block off, including the, sta the stack we're currently running. But that's okay because we're going to ignore that on load. That goes here. This is all allocating more stacks. It calls here to swap in out. And this is where the UData block gets written and read back again using the same piece of code. I don't think this address needs to be aligned. I mean, it can't be aligned because we're all we've been successfully swapping stuff in and out. So buff here is the pointer. What's this doing? Okay, uh, this goes from a pointer to a pointer into user memory to the pointer where the where that bit of user memory currently is. Because again, this is intended for a memory management system, so uh, you can swap blocks in and out all over the place. But that's a no ops. That's fine. But yeah, this doesn't need to be aligned beyond the usual 32-bit alignment. So that's a little bit different, but not much. then well let's try this So now we switch off the kernel stack before calling swap out and doing all the rest of the stuff. No, we can't do that because we need to stay on the stack for restoring stuff. Uh, we could... We could swap out while doing the this. But honestly, I don't think it matters.
Where is the kernel stack set up? It happens in... Now where do we, when do we switch to the kernel stack? It only happens in do fork. Uh, not do fork. System call handler trampoline. This. U block size. What is U block size again? U block. Is. Is in kernel LX 106, 512 by 3, which, as I have verified several times before, is 1536 bytes. Save the stack pointer, switch to the kernel stack, allocate a minimum block off the kernel stack. Call the system call handler. Load back our saved registers, which includes, which, which includes and is limited to, a zero, the link register, which is in slot one, and a two, the exception frame, which is in slot zero. Tracks back over our stack frame, which is in fact no longer needed, and switch back to the user stack, then return. Now, given that this is the very top of the stack. then our code that dumps the stack which I put in process.c here uh, no I didn't, I put it in this is called proc here is actually happening here so I think we will actually be seeing over the top of the stack block Uh, we're right at the very end of the UData block here. And the reason why I printed the address is so that I can see where this is actually, where each slot is. Okay, swap in, crash. Okay, so here is here is our exit stack frame. Keep going up until we find the fork child. Twenty forty seven two thirty six. Uh, missed it. 35, 35, 31, 31, 18, 18, 17, 36, 247, 
29, 38, 31, 31, 32. Right, this is entry. So here is our stack frame before calling the system call. And here it is after. We're no longer seeing that one because we have, we're not forcing cores to be written to the stack. So this is slot five, which is a very different kind of pointer. Right, let's take a look at image dot this syscall uh, trampoline. Syscall handler trampoline. This is where we are loading the kernel stack. I was hoping to actually see the address here, but it's not. Great. Um, okay. Okay, so the UData block is at AF10 and the swap stack starts at BF10. So we haven't actually dumped enough to show the uh, the location to, to show the start of the swap stack. So we we haven't reached the end of the UData block. Could the swap stack be overflowing in certain circumstances? That is very likely, and it's easily it's easily tested. Okay, that's the only code change we've made. So, because if the if we overflow the swap stack while swapping the process out, we'll corrupt the top of the UData block where the kernel stack lives, so that on entry. Okay, well that hasn't done what I thought it was going to. Yeah, if the swap stack overflows, then uh, it could corrupt the top of the kernel stack so that when we reload that process, some of it will be garbage. Again, this doesn't explain why we can successfully return so much. Okay, well, let's find that fork. Here we go. Entry. Put entry up there for a change. Exit. This looks right. Everything here is as it is here, apart from this value. And this is a little bit different. But it doesn't look anything near, near as corrupt as it did previously. And uh, this is exit. And in fact, this is all looking very much like the other entry and exit stacks. So I think the swap stack was overflowing. So great, yet another 512k buffer. Now with 1k buffer. All right, let's chop out 
stopped a lot of this tracing put in it back and see what happens Okay, running in it. It's doing things. Many things. When reading, when swapping something in, you we're never going to touch the data in the swap in that swap slot again. So I'm wondering whether it's worth trimming those blocks just to make life a little bit easier for the uh, FDL. The other thing we'll need to do is to add trim support to the Fusix file system. Otherwise the logical file system will gradually fill up with blocks and a uh, number of free, free blocks will, will just constantly go down until the system is garbage collecting constantly. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, I'll need to add some. I'll need to add a way to tell the kernel to trim a block for that. But that can wait until after we've sorted out what's going on with the application, well, with whatever this thing that is going on is. So much garbage collection. Okay, it's doing something now. So much garbage collection. Okay, right, SH is loading. Here's for Sook, here's for Sook Fusix. Swap something in and it falls over. Four oh one oh oh one FC Ooh, that's code. That's user code. Exception zero is a undefined instruction. instruction that's not a hyperlink illegal instruction called zero at well at here uh, what process is this I think it's sh Well, it swapped in process 2. The last thing it did, the last thing the child did was try to call for Fusix, which isn't there, and then it exited. So it should be the shell. Why is it swapping out three here? Oh, we've got the PIDs here. Right, the shell is process three. So FUSUK is process four.
four exits. We wake up something. PID2, this is init returning. Right. So one FC is not code. Well, actually, that's perfectly valid instruction. It's just not the right one. So at the beginning of the code, we jump to entry. Therefore, this is, in fact, the constant table, quite a big one goes down to here, here is entry, so there should be no reason for it to jump to this address. This does again suggest that Something has gone wrong on returning from the system call. Well, let's do this. And try that again. OK, we run in it. You can see here on the left all the addresses it's returning to. Okay. Fusuk. Fusuk Fusiks back to init and it dies and it is trying to return to 401001 FC which is wrong So I don't think that we've managed to fix our corruption at all by changing the swapper stack size. However, this is driving me completely insane, so I am actually going to take some time out and do that trim thing, because it's going to make uh, iterating so much easier. Yeah, no garbage collections now, thankfully. Yeah, you can see the rets and ents. Or oh, rather, the ents and rets. Uh, EF will move depending on the user stack. Fusuk, Fusuk, Fusix. Swap in it back in and die. So. It does think that we're returning to 401001F9.
and that EF is at this address. So let's find the corresponding fork Uh, which will be way up here uh, this is PID 2 forking is it this? I think it's this EF matches EPC doesn't This looks like it's loaded in the wrong UData block, which would explain a lot of things. I mean, it looks like it is a UData block. So, okay, so who forked with a program counter of 1F9? This is this is in it doing stuff, so here's it trying to run RC. So there will be Okay, this is the PID two is the uh PID two is the shell that is running SH. I disassembled in it, didn't I? So, uh, sh, sh dot bin to sh dot dis dot dis kernel sh dot dis one f nine is Still garbage. I see no references to 1F9. That suggests that the UData block is not someone else's, it's just wrong. And it happens to not be crashing because it's picking up a random pointer from elsewhere. Here's a 182. This is PID 4. So, yeah, this is the Fusuk program, which is quite small. Maddening. All right. We want a. Uh, we want a trim ioctal, which by which we can tell a block device to trim. So this is a. This is the list of ioctals. This is how you do things that don't correspond to the normal read, write, open, close paradigm. Uh, each ioctal on Fusix is a 16-bit number. The top contains various flags saying what they do. You know, if this flag is set, then this can only be used by root. Uh, this one only be used by the kernel, etc. So we're going to do HDIO trim. It's a normal ioctal Anyone who can access the block device can write to it. Therefore, uh, 
Um, therefore, allowing them to trim actually makes no real difference. Um, is that all we need? I think that's all we need. Uh, we want to in here there is a free block routine. Here we go which marks a block as freed in the file system. I believe this is the block number being freed. So here we want to do uh, we want to call an ioctal on the device Normally you need a file descriptor for this, but here we go, dioctal. So this is just going to be void. We don't care about the return code. Device is dev hdio trim and the payload is a pointer to a block number okay then in our dev flash we need to implement a ioctal callback which Um, and I need to find someone who's actually done this and copy their code. Let's try dev hd. No. Do not see what oh, uh, do we need to add this to yeah okay block dev ioctal is doing the work. So let's see if I can find this. Block dev ioctal is interesting. This appears to only support block flush buff ioctals. Right, it looks like there is no plumbing to allow a uh, an ioctal to be plumbed through the block device layer, which is annoying. So we could implement our own ioctal handler. There's a flush operand. This is a block device. Yeah, there's a transfer function and a flush function. But there is nothing to do ioctals. Blast, I thought this was going to be nice and simple. I thought that we could simply yeah, yeah we can do this we can do this uh, this needs to be dev flash ioctal uh, we need to do uh, what does an ioctal function look like one of these Turn in dev. This can go in here. 
int publish octo uint fast ht minor urt request char star data okay and in dev flash we need to implement this function and what it's going to do is to call block dev ioctl okay So we will get this before the block device layer does. So that we can test for our particular ioctl. And yeah, that looks like it's working. And if it's not the one we want, then we just call block dev ioctl. So this is going to be case hgio trim default like so, let's just do uh, yep, that failed exactly as we were expecting uh, block no t, block no pointer equals block no t say certain Trim this block. And let's see what this does. Uh, request. I saw warnings. Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay, now we should see trim messages go past. Uh, this will only happen when files are deleted by the file system layer rather than the swap layer. So we actually need to add this to the swap layer which is in here so swap read this is still some bytes then okay so after after reading in any block from the swap partition, we then trim it. So this, now we should see trim messages go past as things get swapped in. So swap out. And of course, now it does a garbage collection. Swap out. Continuing to swap out. Right. 
and there you saw it swap in with some trim messages. One for each block. And by block here I'm referring to a Fuzix block, otherwise known as a sector. And we just want to wrap these in configs. so that people who don't have file systems that need trimming can uh, don't need the overhead. Okay, so the actual implementation of it, we need to get the block number, which we, which we have. If block nop is less than nand dot, uh, actually this is going to be PPB. Uh, Dara block T. Dara block T is these is the number of arrays blocks. So if this is less than num blocks, then we want to do Dara map trim Dara block no error code always return zero. And let's just keep the the trace message for now. So this will actually start trimming stuff when flash blocks are red, so this might actually begin to help a bit. Although we're doing a lot of swapping out and not very much swapping in, so your mileage may vary. Running SH, swapping out SH. So much garbage collection. Fusuk, Fusix. Okay, you see it's trimmed stuff. It's still doing like garbage collection, but at least it's got a bit of information. Oh, 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 <laughs> uh, yikes, that's, that's terribly wrong, terribly, terribly wrong. I forgot, trim does not take the physical block number, it takes a logical sector number. So we've just told Dara to uh, we've just told Dara to trim lots of stuff that probably have data in them and heaven knows what that's going to do to the file system. It's probably mangled. Uh, so we know the number of arrays blocks we want to get to pages, that's log2 ppb.
let's just try it and see what happens but I'm going to have to rewrite the file system Apart from anything else, rewriting the file system will reset the uh, Dara's idea of what blocks are in use and things will get a lot faster. Cold tea. Come on. This was going to be so much faster if I could use an SD card. This internal flash is dead slow. Actually, the other thing I should do is to in increase the clock speed, rather. Uh, it, particularly if I can increase the peripheral clock speed, then all this flash stuff will be quicker. Uh, this thing's at overclockable up to about 350 megahertz. I also think that I'm going to have to increase the swap partition a bit. There's only four slots and we're actually running four processors. Uh, no, we're not. We're running three. Init, shell, and fusuk. More swapping out. Okay, here's fusuk. and we swap stuff in as we read and it falls over so this is physical block this is this is sector okay i believe that's working so let's just leave it get rid of the trace messages So, how to proceed with the actual debugging? I don't think that EF is corrupt at this point. So here it is the exit. So if I go look for PID2, PID4, PID3, PID2, here's PID2 calling fork. We can see EF is 7DC0, which is correct, while EPC is 4010452, which is nothing like what we have here. I just had a horrible thought. How much stack, how much user stack is it using? Well, actually, I know how much it is because EF is on the stack. So 7DC0. What am I doing? Is that many bytes? Okay. I was wondering, in our swapper, we're only actually saving 3k of stack. So if it, the stack overflows that, are we doing it right?
Well, here's our swap out tracing. So we swap out UData at AF10. We swap out the main process data at 8000 bytes. Then we swap out the stack at E8COO. E eight C O O That's that's ridiculously wrong. Oh, what am I doing? <sighs> How? So I think that this was never staving the stack at all. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Yeah, this code needs cleaning up and being made more understandable. Okay, this the the right address now looks correct for the stack. Fusuk Fusuk Fusix Swapping stuff in. It hasn't crashed. Still hasn't crashed. It's calling lots of stuff without crashing. Have I mentioned it's not crashing? I mean, it's slow as gin, but it is working. spotted any XX recently. And then it dies. <laughs> now it's crashed. Okay, well that's got a lot further than it had. So... What's it done? Well, lots of swapping. Um, I th think I'll get rid of this tracing as it's basically spam at this point. This has... It's printing lots of error messages, that's what it's doing. But it's hard to see because of all the debug tracing. ETC mtab cannot create. Okay, let's get rid of some of this tracing. Normally I say that it's nice when bugs are caused by me doing something stupid. 
because they're usually pretty easy to fix. But in this situation, in this particular case, they really weren't. Okay. Uh, we can probably turn this off. Turn all of this off. Okay, this is it trying to call set date and failing. Set date not found. What was it doing when it crashed? It was at 4021 BACF. Really? That's not in the kernel code. That looks like strings. So this has done a hyperspace jump somewhere into the kernel. I don't know why. Or where from. But it's probably not good. Okay, now... Um, is there more tracing I can dispense with? Uh, let's get rid of this, but I won't delete it. Let's try that. We might be able to see a bit more of what's going on. Of course, now we get no tracing as the as garbage collection happens. Okay, so I think there's supposed to be an error message here, actually. Like not found or something. I can get rid of these. Yes, definite finger drumming. I am going to have to figure out what's going on with the SD card. I've asked for assistance and not really come up with anything. I mean, it should have worked. I can't see any reason why it was behaving the way it was. On the plus side, I do happen to know that those pins that we were using for the SD card are also used by the JTAG stuff, and they now have a JTAG adapter. So not having the SD card attached to those pins is possibly a good thing.
but this kind of delay is making the, would make the system unusable. Okay, set date, set date not found. That's our first readable message coming from the kern, coming from uh, SH. It's, it's trying to run a shell script here. So remount not found. MTAB cannot create. Why can't it create MTAB? ETC exists. Ah, I know why. Because remount can't be found, it hasn't been able to remount the file system read-write. Therefore it can't write to anything. And then it dies. So it looks like it's trying to swap in in it. It swapped out uh, three. So we've got in it as one, sh is two. So this script is terminating. So that's happening here. It should then be swapping in in it itself. We get wait pid is done something. Oh, uh, that comes from All oh, right, I thought that was some tracing I'd put into init, but apparently I haven't. Right, so here, uh, init is waiting for any process. And we'll either return this error to indicate that there is nothing to wait for, this error to indicate it was interrupted, or uh, the actual process. So. Let's just speed things up a bit. Um, and we want syscall proc. We want to know where wait pit goes. And the easiest way to do that is to uh, turn system call tracing on and I think we also want to turn sleep on
So now we can see the system calls go past. And their parameters, which is nice. And while that's booting, let me get rid of that tracing. So you see here, this is in it has returned. Uh, no, in it has called wait pid, waiting for any process, um, and then the kernel process switches to whatever is running. Normally that kind of hyperspace jump is usually caused by stack corruption. It could be corrupting some kind of jump table in memory. remember to turn on optimization when building those binaries in the libraries, didn't I? Yeah, minus OS. Come on. Incidentally, if you've ever used a solid state disk and it's got full and your system suddenly grinds to a halt and you've got no idea why, um, there's nothing using a lot of CPU, it's just slow. It could well be because your solid state disk, the latency has suddenly shot up because it's spending all of its time garbage collecting trying to open up space. And the solution is either to turn trim on to allow the system to free up space to the, to the SSD or to, you know, delete lots of files. Right. So what has happened? Uh, we've swapped in the process in slot 194 and given it's quite big it seems to be a lot of processors that are 16... 38... Yeah, well, although this one does has a different code size. I think this is swapping in and out in it a lot. And in it's just quite big, or possibly the shell. Whatever it is, it's been swapped in. It's in it, it's called wait pid. Oh, uh, but the shell does that too. Pid three. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, but I see it exits. With exit status one, we send a signal to process two that is in it being told that the uh, that the process is exiting. 
but we jump off into nowhere before returning from the system call. So we get the get proc returning message, which is process.c. And then it dies shortly after. So it must be returning here. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, 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 we're in, we're here. This is for single tasking. Wait. Wait. We are single tasking. Why? Do I have this in the wrong mode? I think this is snappier. So what that option does is it switches the way the scheduler works to a different type of scheduler. Uh, it always runs children before parents. When a ch child dies, it will only then swap the parent back in. It means you can't run stuff in the background, but on a single tasking system you can't anyway. There's some more sophisticated logic to do with pipes and so on, but it means that the current process is much more likely to... that the current process won't get swapped out unless there's a specific need. I think it will work without it because it just changes the scheduler logic but it would involve lots of swaps in and out and basically thrashing for no real benefit. Hey, it printed the banner. It printed the Welcome to Fusix banner. Hey, and we've got a login prompt. <laughs> wow. That worked. Um, okay. I'm not entirely sure why that made it work. But I mean, the get proc code here should still work, just not very well. So the fact 
that it the fact that it died platform idle have we called platform idle I mean have, I mean, have we implemented platform idle uh, tricks dot s Platform idle. Yeah, okay. I just wondered whether this was jumping into nowhere. But no, it is actual real code. I mean, we can't log in because uh, the TTY. doesn't know how to read characters. Yeah. Uh, what we need to do is... I'm not quite sure what we need to do, actually. Uh, normally, the TTY is interrupt-driven. And this, rout this routine here, uh, this is stolen from the MSP430 code. This will read the character from the buffer, from the UART buffer, and this will poke it into the TTY buffer. Uh, and it will also cause the process to wake up to consume that uh, byte. We may have to actually do a real TTY for that. Okay, that's interesting, a little bit unnerving. I. Is that the only place it is indeed? So it's get proc and it's the timer interrupt, which we're not calling because you don't have a timer yet. Um, where's process.c? So what the timer does is it uh, it increments the counters that tell each process how long it's been running for. It increments the global counter, the global timer. And if you're not single tasking, it uh, looks to see if there are any processes that need rescheduling. We are single tasking. Oh, that's where that lives. Okay. Uh, we are single tasking, and therefore uh, we did, we never wake up processes other than the current one, unless there are unless it's made runnable by some other reason. Let me just find the the get proc logic in single tasking mode I uh, if we are ready run if we're not running run ah yes we don't run other tasks pipes work We turn zombie, come back to this parent. Well, pipes work on the MSP430, so did I... It's possible it's, this isn't running in single tasking mode. Right, the MSP430 is not running in single tasking mode. So, uh, that's because it had fast SD card swap, which we don't. Anyway, uh, we have a prompt. That's nice. I suppose the next thing to do is to get the TTY running, which may involve getting an interrupt handler and get the timer running. I suppose find more things, find more executables to put in. But once the TTY is in place, we should be able to actually log in, which is nice. 
Anyway, that was a bit of a shambles, but we discovered a number of really nasty bugs and fixed them. So that's progress. Uh, yeah. Um, I will actually, I think, go through and turn off all the tracing uh, and then check it all in, but I'll do that offline. So, so, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.